We're going to move on to uh, our next presenter. And, you know, throughout the day, we've been asking you to make sure that you're sending out to the world via t those t uh, tweets that you're sending out to uh, TEDxPT using that hashtag. You've been, you've been letting people know what's going on here in the room. Well, our next presenter actually contends that by using Twitter and other social media, using your smartphones in very, very smart ways, that you can actually help your community come back from natural disaster. Sounds pretty amazing, but that's exactly what he's going to tell us about today. So I'd like for you to please welcome John Copenhaver. He's going to come to us and present Crisis Rethink Community Resilience. I very much appreciate being here, and thanks to the TED folks for inviting me. Um, crisis Rethink is a very serious subject. So I'd like to tell you a story about uh, two very serious people. One time, there were these two crisis managers, and they decided that they wanted to get together one Saturday afternoon to go fishing. And so Saturday afternoon came, and they got their tackle boxes and their fishing rods, and they went down to the local lake, and they rented a boat, and they went out to a remote section of the lake and anchored, dropped their lines in the water, and started fishing. And they caught all kinds of fish. It was absolutely amazing. And after about a half an hour of this, one of the crisis managers turned to the other one and said, you know, we really have to remember where this is. We have to figure out how we can get back here. The second crisis manager said, I think I've got just the thing. He said, in my tackle box, I've got a magic marker. I can take the magic marker out, and I can draw an X right here. And we can remember where this place is. And the first crisis manager said, that's the stupidest thing that I have ever heard in my life. What if we don't get the same boat next time? <laughs> Hence, crisis rethink. I'd like to start out today by a recent headline. This is from October the 24th of this year. It's the front page of USA Today. And if you look at it, it says, disasters strain FEMA's resources. The subtitle is the number of declarations that have been done this year really is draining the resource that FEMA has to respond to very large scale disasters like storms. And you'll see the word disaster in red block letters printed 89 times there. 89 times for 89 presidentially declared disasters. So far in 2011. And the truth of the matter is that number's probably gone up since then because we've had the northeast storms, we've had flooding in the southeast down in Florida. The numbers of disasters just continue to mount. And so what we're seeing now is a tremendous drain on the resources of the government responses to be able to respond to it. Let me talk for just a second about what I see the problem to be here. And I'm going to break it down into four premises. The first premise is that destructive events are more frequent, they're more energetic, and they cause greater impacts these days. And this trend is expected to continue for the next decade. The second premise, governments from national to local, not just the United States but other countries as well, have diminishing capabilities to be able to aid the increasing numbers of stricken communities. More disasters, more communities, less government resource. Premise number three, and this one's gonna be a little tough to get your head around, but think about the fact that the private sector is not going to bail out the government. <laughs> I may be going out on a limb with that one. But the private sector help is probably going to be in the form of assistance to the communities themselves, if any assistance is provided at all. And premise number four, and this one gives me a little bit of a problem, but I have to say it. Because of media oversaturation, most Americans now believe that someone else is responsible for disasters. Someone else is going to take care of the response, take care of the recovery. We've seen this all too often. And this this disheartens me. We've seen when disaster strikes, 
uh, the cameras from helicopters flying over, showing people who are waving signs or waving their fists, where's FEMA? Where's FEMA? And that bothers me because I remember a day where we used to have communities that had civil defense representatives and they wore armbands and they wore helmets and they organized our communities and they basically brought people together and they tried to get the community to be a little bit better prepared, a little bit better respond. And where we went from civil defense and communities to where's FEMA, I'm not sure. But if you think about it, it has to have been relatively recently because FEMA's only been around since 1979. But for a lot of people in the audience, that's been a long time. It hadn't been quite that long for me. Why are we rethinking this problem? Why should we rethink this problem? We have a disaster paradigm. We have the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We have the Department of Homeland Security. Other countries have similar organizations. Something bad happens and people ride to our rescue. This has worked for a long time, for about 40 years, which again, to me, is not very long, but it's worked reasonably well in varying degrees. Our paradigm's effectiveness, unfortunately, is deteriorating, and that's why we have to rethink this. We have more high-impact bad things happening. We have fewer riders, fewer knights on horses coming to our assistance. They arrive later. Their rescues are incomplete. The amount of resource that they can bring is diminishing with each successive disaster. If you look at this, it's really unfortunate. We seem to be having so many events that the response has to diminish. It's a bad day for nights, so to speak. So, we need a new paradigm. We desperately need a new paradigm. There's an old saying, all disasters are local. And as the former regional director of FEMA, I've seen that. During my tenure, FEMA responded to 58 presidentially declared disasters in this part of the country. I've seen devastation on huge scales. And every single time, it's communities that are devastated. It's people, it's homes small businesses in some instances. That's where the devastation really, you can see it, you can feel it. This isn't someone else's problem. This is our problem. This isn't something that should be viewed through the lens of the government's gonna fix it. This is our problem. I have a few recommendations here today. First recommendation is that we have to refocus our thinking on our own communities. We have to make them better able to recover from painful events. We have to make our own communities resilient. We literally have to go back to the future. Only it's a new future. We have tools. We have capabilities. We have new technologies that we can create new lines of communication and collaboration within the communities where we live and work. As was mentioned before, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have YouTube. We literally have the capability in the immediate aftermath of something bad happening to take still pictures and to take video and to be able to send those pictures and that video almost anywhere in the world to, to anybody that has a smartphone or some capability to receive it. And when you think about that, from the time that I was working for FEMA, where we had to literally send out teams of people to do what we call damage assessment, to the point in time, for instance, when the tornado hit here in Atlanta, that we were literally seeing postings on YouTube within a few minutes of the tornado hitting. It's remarkable. This is a game changer. But it's a technology that we have to use to focus more on the communities where we live and not be so focused on FEMA, on the government coming in, on government fixing it for us. And please don't misunderstand, I'm a big fan of FEMA. 
I spent three and a half years there, and they were three and a half of the, of the best years that I've had in my professional work life. I have tremendous respect for FEMA, but it's almost unfair what they're being asked to do these days. As a part of this rethink, we have to look very closely at the real hazards that our community faces. We now have the technology to be able to drill down to very specific areas within a community. We can actually look almost block by block at what the risks are, what the threats are, that that particular piece of land, that particular block, that particular area faces. Flooding, where's the water gonna go? How deep is it gonna get? In what direction is it gonna be flowing and how fast? We can figure this stuff out now. We literally have the technology and the capability to really focus on very small areas and it helps us understand what the threats are that communities face better than ever before. We have to look at the resources that we have at the community level. And the bottom line is I'm not talking here about just the concept of the resources. I'm talking about using the new technology that we have, using the capabilities that we have, using the incredible information processing and information storage capabilities that we have in very small spaces very small devices, to revolutionize the amount of information that we accrue, that we gather about specific communities. What do we have? What all is available here? What do we need? Do we need chainsaws? Do we need tarps? Do we need fresh water? Well, we probably have it somewhere here. If we just knew where it was and we just had a plan to be able to access it on a local basis. We also need to look at the people and groups in our community that we're gonna to wanna to involve in the response efforts. What I call the key community stakeholders. And here, I'm not just talking about the formal leadership. I'm not just talking about the mayor, the local elected officials, the fire chief, the police chief, the emergency management director. I'm also talking about informal leadership. The people that communities really look to in times of crisis, in times of disaster. That informal leadership doesn't necessarily carry the job title. I'm talking about people like George Bailey of Bailey Building and Loan, who did very well for a town called Bedford Falls some time ago in his fight against the Wall Street banker named Old Man Potter and was able to really help that community out even though he didn't have a formal position. And by the way, I've heard an unconfirmed rumor, and I'm not totally certain of this, but I believe that there's an Occupy Bedford Falls movement that's starting for the holidays <laughs> in protest of Old Man Potter, but again, that's a rumor, and I hate to spread rumors. But we have to look at these concepts in terms of leadership. And if you let me, I'm gonna give you some of the examples of community stakeholders. Here I've got the traditional community stakeholders. I have local government, I've got schools, hospitals, but I also have waste collection because if we ever forget that we need to have our garbage picked up, then we're going to have a problem. I've got down here grocery stores. Where are you gonna buy your groceries? If you don't have access to a place where you can buy groceries, then what's that do to your capability to live in a community? If your kids can't go to school, if you can't get groceries, then you realize just how key these capabilities, these businesses, these arms of local government, all of these things are in the makeup of a community. And here you'll see that at the very bottom corner, I have a heart, and those are the homeowners, because lest we ever forget, homeowners absolutely are the heart of any community. I wanted to show you something called a resilient community. This is my vision of a resilient community. It's a little bit difficult to represent, so in the process I had to invent something that I like to call the wheel. <laughs> I'm not sure it's gonna catch on, but it looks kind of flashy. <laughs> Around the outside, you see numbers corresponding to the previous slide. Those are the key stakeholders. Those are the people and the entities within the community that really make the community run. And they're connected by spokes. 
Those spokes represent lines of communication and collaboration with a hub. And the hub really is sort of the heart of the decision-making capability of the community. It's that informal and formal leadership that I talked about. The hub is connected to the key stakeholders of the community and all the decisions that are made in crisis situations within that hub are transmitted out to the key stakeholders so that they know what's going on. In, in this resilient community that I've imagined, they're constantly informed and they are a part of the decision-making process. They are connected to that hub of leadership. But again, this is only one example of a resilient community. There are others. And each hub is going to look a little bit different from community to community. So let me come up with just a couple of conclusions. First, let me say that you, the next generation, will have to use new think Gesundheit. New thinking to create resilient communities that will be different from the ones that my generation would have thought of. I won't say that our time has passed, because even though I've been around a while, I'm not quite that old. But the truth of the matter is that the burden of creating these new infrastructures and these new capabilities, of utilizing these new technologies to create something that we've, we haven't seen quite the likes of. We have seen the old style communities where neighbors knew each other. We haven't seen the new style communities that we're going to need that will employ some of the concepts like actually getting to know the people that live around you, actually people talking to each other and businesses communicating, but they're gonna employ new technologies. Technologies that when I was growing up, we could barely imagine. And it's going to be this generation that creates these new paradigms. I would implore you, please, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, please begin looking at your community through new eyes. If I were to walk up to you and say, it's your job to protect this community, your community, what would you do? Who would you want to talk to? What kinds of things would you want to get done? First, second, third. If it were your job to protect the community, what would you do? And interestingly enough, as we go into an uncertain future and a future with more crisis events, it will be increasingly your job to be a part of that future and to be a part of the preparedness and the response to those events. And finally, I want to point out that you, you start by having a lot to work with. You have new networks. You have te new technologies. You have incredible access to information. You literally have the global libraries at your fingertips. You have people can tell you about what it used to be like, like me. Not that that's necessarily going to be of a lot of interest to a lot of you, but I know that in terms of telling stories, you probably, rather than listen to them, you'd rather eat your iPhones. But you have access to people like me. The new paradigms that are going to be created, though, won't be my paradigms. They won't be your paradigms alone. It'll be a mix, but it really is going to be primarily on your shoulders. These new paradigms will be your paradigms for your communities. And with that, I'd just like to say, according to a, some of my old friends, seafarers, may you have fair winds and trailing seas, and thank you for listening. Thank you, John. Um, before I let you go, as you're talking about the, the shift in paradigm between one generation and the next, we had a question come in from the uh, College University at Maastricht that, where the students and faculty are all watching in. They wanted to know, in a crisis, how do you communicate with those who are outside the digital divide? I guess this is where going old school might help. I don't know. I think that going old school is going to be the way that you're going to have to communicate with some of the people because batteries wear down power is out sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you, you literally have to look at all the different kinds of communications capabilities. And sometimes knocking on doors and actually physically talking to people That's is going to work. I, I, I know. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. So we have a variety of ways, I guess, that we have to look at when addressing these crises. We have to look at all the things that, that we have used and all the things that we now can do. Mm -hmm. And we have to come up with this new paradigm of the blend of that and, and really focus it at the community level. Very good. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. <laughs> Thank you.